Today we're starting a new series, Fight for the Family. Not the big family fight. Because there's plenty of those, come on. The family fights. But how about fight for the family? Let's fight for the family today. Let's get the fight back in us, amen? Let's not lose. The devil's after the family. He's after the home. Why? Because if he can conquer the home, he can conquer the church. If there's dysfunction in the family, the dysfunction will get in the church. Isn't that right? And, And this isn't a message about condemnation and how much we've missed the mark. It's about getting back on the mark. Amen. It's about getting the moxie. It's about getting back up off the ground after you've been on the mat. Some of you, you've been on the mat too long. And you think, oh, the 10 count is long gone, right? Eight, nine, 10. You feel like the enemy's already counted you out. But get back in the fight today. Pastor Lori and I, we've been here for 20, almost 27 years. And we've seen a lot of people grow up in this church. We've seen a lot of people grow up, get married in this church, have kids in this church, and we've seen a lot of people leave church. And what I mean by that, I don't mean just leaving our church and going to another church. I'm talking about leaving church, abandoning their faith. I'm talking about kids that we saw at the altar, kids that we saw praying through, kids that we saw filled with the Holy Ghost, praying in other tongues, people that would sob and snot and fall down under the power, and where are they at today? George Barna, he does a lot of statistical research and data on churches. And he revealed that in his latest study on youth, he found that 65% of all high schoolers, when they graduate, leave church. 65%. We're not talking 5%. We're not like 8%. We're not in single digits. We're not even like 25%. We're at 65%. We've got the greatest message on the planet. We're the only ones with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The only ones. We just happen to believe that. We just believe that the Bible's true. And and I'm I'm just sitting here and I'm astounded like, man, we got the greatest message. We got the greatest truth. We've got the greatest power. We got the power of the Holy Spirit. We got all of this stuff. And why are 65% of high schoolers abandoning their faith after they graduate? And it suddenly dawned on me that it, your church experience will never trump your home experience. Your church faith will never trump your home faith. What I'm trying to say is the kids that were at the altar and the kids that were praying and the kids that were crying and the kids that were faithful and serving and and plugged in and and then had left, what we found is those kids were the ones that abandoned their faith. The reason they did so is because there was a contradiction at home. There's a contradiction between living at home and living at church. There was hypocrisy. And I'm not talking about perfection. Let's just get that clear, because I'm up here. (laughs) All right? What I'm talking about is humility. That when we do miss it, not if we miss it, if we make a mistake, if we lose our cool, if we do something wrong, when we do, are we humble enough to make it right? Are we humble enough to say Jesus is Lord and I was wrong and he's right? That, that's the differentiating factor between this pride and this ego and this I'm going to have it my way. And, and, and church is kind of like a, a, an accessory. Right? It's an accessory. It's, it's, I can add Jesus to everything else that I'm doing. This is one thing that, that we have to be careful of when we minister in Nepal because Hinduism, Hinduism has 333 million gods. So we have to be very careful that when we preach Jesus Christ, they don't think of Jesus Christ as 333 million and one God. Just another one to add on. And so many people in in America see it that way, that we just add Jesus to our life. And that becomes the contradiction in the homes, that Jesus is not the center of our world. The church is not the center of our world. And, and when I say center of our world, it just means that it keeps us focused on the right things. Right. doesn't mean that we're in church seven days a week. 
You, you know, I, I've known revivals that run seven days a week for two, three years. And you know what comes out of that? Chaos, dysfunction. Why? Because you can't sustain that kind of life. Family still needs family time. Marriage still needs marriage time. The home still needs to be mowed. Right? I mean, you can't sustain stuff like that. That's why we're to live line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. But when you make God the center focus of your life, everything else just comes into alignment. (laughs) And this is why the enemy is trying to destroy the family. The enemy is doing everything that he can, and you know it's true, on Sunday morning to prevent you from coming to church. And it starts Saturday night. Somebody's got a sniffle. Somebody's got stomach cramps. Somebody's got a chill. Somebody's got a ball, a ball game. Somebody's, somebody saw that the sun's gonna be out. <laughs> come, come on, there, there's all kinds of reasons the enemy tries to come and combat us to, 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 to cause us to become confused and, and distracted with what we're supposed to be staying focused on. And that's why he went after Adam and Eve. He went after the first marriage. Man, if he, can, if he can bust up the marriage, if he can bring confusion in the marriage, and I'm not even talking about people that get divorced. I'm talking about people that are still married and their life's still in confusion. Their marriage is still in confusion. It's, it's still walking on eggshells or there's still arguments and fights and, and things getting you know thrown through the air. Some of you guys are like the Matrix at home. <laughs> Dodging pots and pans and shoes. <laughs> and then we show up to church and go, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Some of you, you could probably pitch in the minor leagues. You probably could. You got that good arm. Holes in the walls. I've got, we've got holes in our walls, but that was from Dario practicing his karate. <laughs> I walked upstairs and I'm like, what is this hole in our wall? I was practicing my kicks and my foot slipped. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> we, the upstairs bathroom door still does not latch to the boys because when Dario was young, he, no, Chase, oh, it was Chase. Chase was young. He locked himself in the bathroom. And it was, of course, on a Sunday morning. It always happens on Sunday morning. And what do you think? Mama bear busts through the door. Bam! Don't mess with her. That door ain't gonna save you, son. Genesis 2.15 says that the Lord took the man. Hey, guys, I just want you to say, I'm the man. <laughs> Go, yeah, say, I, I'm the man. I'm the man. Because she ain't going to say it, but you can say it. I'm the man. God took the man, the man, and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. <laughs> to work it and take care of it. Now, what I want to say is, men, God put you in your home to work it and take care of it. God called you to be the man of your home to work it and take care of it. And a lot of times, we don't want to work it. We want to watch her work it. Work it, girl. Right? (laughs) We want to watch her work it while we sit there and go, can you give me something else to drink? Right, we come home, disengage. I work so hard. I want you to know that mamas work just as hard as daddies. I want to say they work even harder. Because some are still working outside of the home, and then they come home and work in the home and watch you sit there while you are watching them work. You know, we have to engage in the home, men. We cannot recluse. I, I, you know, I don't understand. There was no man cave in the garden. There was no man cave. Besides, she didn't have clothes on. Why would you be hiding from her? (laughs) Just saying. 
You know, I, it's, it's like we men, we need this retreat and this hideout to get away from the wife. Well, what kind of marriage do you have? I'm not talking about, you know, having some alone time, some proper things. There's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes it's this mindset that I've got to have my own space and she's got to have her own space. And, and we only coincide when we have to, like ships passing in the night. That's not a marriage. But men, we can't afford to disengage. We can't just hide out in projects and, and this and that of things that I got to do and hang out with the men and blah, blah, blah. There's nothing wrong with having some proper God, God, guy time. But it becomes improper when it becomes an imbalance and something in the way of our marriage. But God's going to hold you accountable on judgment day and you're going to stand before God and he's going to say, did you take care of what I gave you? Did, I take, did you take care of what I gave you? Genesis 128 says that God told him, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish, the sea of the air, the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God gave him dominion. And what did he do? He gave it up. Because he was not taking care of what God gave him. Okay? He gave it up. Now I want you to know this, men. We have not been given dominion. We have to take dominion. Take dominion back. Here it is. You see, through Adam, one man sinned and we lost dominion. And through Jesus Christ, we can retake our dominion. You see, it just doesn't come automatically. You just don't show up at the altar, say I do, and suddenly have dominion. You, you don't have that respect of your kids. You earn that. You create that. You don't have the respect of your wife. You create it. You nurture it. You build it. You know, I, I've worked with a lot of people that, that have been married and that I've married and they would come in my office and sit there and they swoon at each other and they're so happy and they're so excited. Present company excluded. I've not met with you yet, so you're not involved in this conversation. Brad, Sam, you, you're fine. We've got two couples that are going to get married this year. We're excited for you. We're excited. But I want to talk about the ones that do it weird. Okay, And they sit there and they're just, and everything's just perfect. Why? Because they're so focused on the marrying, they're not focused on the marriage. And I don't like our culture in how we marry today because there's so much pressure on the marrying and the day. The day. Let, can, can we just sum it down? It's not the day, it's the 10 minutes that it takes to get married. Yeah. And I, I, could we just break it down to the second of how much that costs? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying do something nice and do it a, in, a, in a way that's appreciative and that, a way that you can value and honor it and, and esteem it. But there's so much pressure on I'm getting married for everyone else. I've got to meet everybody else's expectations. Uh, I, I, I play pickleball with one guy, and, and he gave his daughter, she was getting married, gave his daughter $20,000 and said, honey, here's a bank account. Your name is on it, and this money's yours. You can use whatever you want for the wedding, but whatever you don't use for the wedding, the rest is yours. It's all yours. You know what she did? She spent all $20,000 on the wedding. They spent nothing on the marriage. And we wonder why the divorce rate is so high. You know, we say that there's a 50% divorce rate in the world, in America, and we say that that divorce rate is almost that high in the church, but really that number skewed because of the divorce, remarried, divorce, remarried, it skews that. It's actually, first time divorce marriage rate is somewhere around 28 to 30%. That's still too high, guys. Why? Because we're not focusing enough on our responsibilities after the day. What that day is, because dominion is taking dominion every day. And we, we were talking with, you know, we were sitting talking with the family and, and uh, Lori and I were saying, you know, we'll be married 27 years this June. And yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> wow. And... 27 years, and I'm like, you know, we we're telling our boys, we are not who we were when we got married. 
I was a different, I was a boy. I was a boy right there stuffed in this little man's body. <laughs> I weighed 127 pounds when we got married. My hair weighed more than I did. Because <laughs> I had a mullet. I had the sweet mullet. I had the shaved sides with the waterfall all the way down to here. And it was permed. That'll make you feel like a man. <laughs> Sitting there with curlers in your hair. Sup? <laughs> That'll test your testosterone. So... We, you know, we're sitting there and we're like, we are not who we used to be. I, thank God I'm not who I used to be. I was, I was not the man that I should have been when I got married. But she's worked very hard to train me. <laughs> she really has. It has taken years of correction and training. But I thank God that over time, his grace has allowed me to grow into the man whom I him to become. Um, what's that movie with uh, Tom Cruise and uh, J Jerry Maguire? And she's sitting there and, I love you for the man that you are and the man that you will be someday. And I look back at that and I went, when I first saw it, I was like, ouch, I'm a man now. <laughs> right, right? That's the way we want to be. But actually, Manhood is developed over time. Manhood, manhood. It, it, just because God gave you something that women don't have doesn't make you a man. You understand? That doesn't graduate you into manhood. It's, it's your actions, it's your attitude. And when we look at this in verse 16, going back into chapter 2, it says, The Lord commanded the man, you're free to eat of any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will certainly die. Okay? You, can't, you can eat of any tree, but you must not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then he says, it's not good for man to be alone. I'm gonna make a helper suitable for him. Can we just say that we know, men, it's not good for us to be alone? right? Because we end up buying things that we shouldn't buy. We come home with things and she goes, where'd you get that? Why'd you buy that? We don't need that. <laughs> I just did this recently because we were remodeling our house because we had a flood. And of course, when you have a flood, suddenly you have to redo the kitchen. <laughs> so I'm told, which is good. I'm in agreement with you. I'm in agreement. I said, yes, honey, I agree with you. And because I realized that when we, we took out our fireplace and we switched our living room around and just made it right, right, so I could go to Costco and get a different TV, right? right? <laughs> <clears throat> you and me, buddy, we're on this. We're going to Costco after service. So I go to Costco and I was going to get a 60, can I just talk? All right. There'll be a spiritual point here. <laughs> I was going to get a 65 inch because what I've had for years, years is a 55 inch. So I went, all right, I'll be modest. I'll get a 65 and that'll fit on the wall nicely. And I got there and, and I went 65. What's after 65? 70. 75. 80. But you know... <laughs> Then there's a projector. No, but I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm like, 60, well, I'm not going to do 80 because that would be too ostentatious. <laughs> right? That would be like people at church, can you believe the pastor got an 80-inch TV? Can you believe that? How dare him? What is he, blind? You know, so, so I'm like, well, and then 75 is too close to 80 because, you know, People could, there'd still be some complaints. So, so then I'm like, well, let's see. The Talimonies have a 70 inch. So, so I'm like, you know, they've inspired me. So I got the 70. 
Now, I don't know if you know this, amen. I don't know if you know this, but the box that the 70 inch comes in is about the size of a house. And when I carried it in, I tried to be as nondescript as possible. <laughs> Bringing it in, how you doing, da da da. And it wasn't, you know, and, and she did this little heel flip and goes, what in the world? <laughs> Needless to say, she's in agreement with me. It is on the wall. And I watched Brother Copeland and Ron Carpenter and <laughs> Downton Abbey. What does that have to do with anything? <laughs> Life. There's life that we go through, decisions that we make. But in reality, you know, we got two lives that we're trying to bring together. That's right. We come from different backgrounds. And both of us are pastor's kids. Both of us are raised in the same spiritual atmosphere. But we think differently, believe it or not. Redneck? Not redneck. Right? I mean, we were watching blooper videos the other day, and I'm seeing my brothers in arms out there and their four wheelers in the mud, and I'm going, yeah! And she's going, ew. We were watching animals attack animals yesterday, right? So the guys come over the house, and I'm like, let's watch something, you know? And we're watching polar bears chase down seals, and, and it was really traumatic sitting next to her. But we're different. But it doesn't mean we're wrong. It doesn't mean that we're not right for each other. A suitable companion doesn't mean, and when you get this mindset of, well, um, I'm looking for my soulmate. And because I, I'm just not fulfilled with this person, they're probably not my soulmate. I married the wrong person. There is not a soulmate on the planet. Because what you're doing is you're looking for somebody to complete you. You're looking for somebody that will satisfy you in every whim. That, that's not a soulmate, that's a slave. That's a slave. Because eventually you're going to be disappointed and you're going to disappoint them. And if you don't have the spirit of God and if you don't know how to be the man and the woman of the home and a woman and a man of the word of God, you will not come through it successfully. It takes the heart to have dominion and say, no, no, no. We may not understand this right now. And let me tell you something. The Bible is so right about not going to bed angry. It is. When you are in disagreement as a husband and wife, do not go to bed angry. Now, this is what it means. It doesn't mean that you are able to resolve it in the moment because it could be 2 a.m. in the morning and you could be upset, right? And so what you do is you can be at least agreeable to say, look, let's, let's put this on the nightstand. Let's just table this. Let's agree that we love each other, but we'll address this in the morning. Okay? Okay, good. Good night. What you don't do is go to bed when you think the argument is over and it's not. Because if you do that, something bad could happen to you. <laughs> Years ago, we were living in a duplex We'd been married a few years and we were having a conversation. <laughs> and being, being the stubborn man that I was, I put my foot down, I said my piece, I'm done, I'm going to bed. I went to bed, I was done, she wasn't done. I went to sleep and I woke up wet. She had the biggest glass that she could find and she just baptized me right there in the bed. It was awesome. I stood straight up in bed. And I'm like, I guess you wanna talk still. But from then on, I learned my lesson. <laughs> I've never gone to bed angry since. We've worked it out. <laughs> Woo, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> so, <laughs> the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds, the skies, the wild animals, but for Adam, there was no suitable helper found. 
So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. Be careful when you go to sleep, man. Things will come up missing. <laughs> While he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then placed and closed the place up with flesh. And then the Lord God made woman from the rib that he had taken out of man and he had brought her to the man and said, man, check it out. <laughs> you know, he named woman. Whoa, man. <laughs> woman. Man. Woman. I want you to know, when God created Eve, he didn't take a bone from his foot so that she would be beneath him. God did not take a bone from his head so that she would be above him. But took it from his heart to be close to him and to work with him, and to be compatible together. Yeah. Now, when we first got married, you know, I was, I was raised in a bit of a chauvinistic atmosphere. Um, I used to hear the term sometimes, men do men. My, my sister-in-law wanted to come up and help us roof, uh, a roof that we were working on, and my, my dad was up there, and she's like, I want to come up there and roof. And he said, I didn't say, it. he said this at the time. He says, men do men work, women do women work. Ooh. Well, she didn't come up. So, you know, I figured that when I get married, you know, I just make the decision. That's, that's the way it is because I'm the head of the home. And I've learned that God did not make her from my foot. I've learned that I need to embrace what she has to share. While we have the, the side of logic and reasoning and we're able to like disconnect and disassociate from feelings and difficult moments and there's times that we need that kind of wisdom and that kind of decision strength in a man. But there are things that the woman brings to the table that we do not have. And that is intuition. And that is a sense of feeling and emotion that we don't have. And so in making decisions, God wants us to be together. Why? Because he made a suitable helper so that we can be compatible working together with. So now instead of just making decisions and say, well, I bought it. Well, this is the way it is. Blah, blah, blah. Right? Uh, we've come to the point where we don't make a decision unless we're in agreement because if we make the decision it's better not to make the decision and go without than it is to make the decision and be in disagreement. And sometimes that might mean that you'll miss out on something. But what you won't miss out on is peace, honor, and respect in your home. There are times that you can play your man card. Be careful when you do. Because it will get taken away from you. There are times, ladies, you can play your woman card, and you know. You get that little neck thing, and you, know. you don't even have to say anything. You just do the little eye thing, and like lasers, and we're like, vaporize us. I mean, there are times that we can do that, but for the most part, we need to be in unity because God made us suitable helper, a compatible helper. And you, you, we're so incompatible. I'll tell you what's incompatible, pride yeah. and arrogance. But if you can be patient and if you can step back and say, all right, let's pray about this. Let's pray about this. But I want you to know that as we pray about this, the most important thing in this decision is how I feel about you. I think I heard a woman just say, "Ah." <laughs> Isn't that sweet? Chris, you can use that if you want. <laughs> Honey, the most important part of this decision, say it with me, is you. Yes, all right, you, you, that's right. <laughs> hey, life is life, right? I don't think we laugh enough about our lives and our challenges and our struggles and pull back and say, you know what, that was really stupid. <laughs> right, that was really stupid. What was I thinking? Just don't go, I told you so. <laughs> right? 
It's hard for us to be humble when we hear, I told you so after that. Come on. I'm going to stop there. I want to pray. I want to pray, and we're going to have water baptism in a minute, but the most important thing that we face right now is the answer to this question. Are you born again? Is Jesus Christ the most important thing in your life? Going to church does not save you. That's not the, 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 the sign of a Christian. The sign of a Christian is saying, Jesus, I surrender to you. You're my Lord and Savior. Forgive me of my sins. My wife and I was talking this morning about how many times so many people have a false understanding of what salvation is. They'll hear, and, and many of it, much of it is to blame to the pastors that are in the pulpits. Because what they like is they like that number. They like, oh, we had 20 hands raised today. We had 40 hands raised today. Uh, hey, raise your hands. Anybody? Just everybody, right? Raise your hand. Okay, thank you. Now I can put on the internet. You know how many people raise their hands today? <laughs> I mean, we can motivate people to raise hands. But salvation is not just a... I check marked that box. I prayed that magic prayer. Jesus is not an accessory. He's your everything. What a lot of people don't realize is Jesus came to save you from your sins. And yes, you're going to go to heaven for eternity. You're not going to go to hell. Thank you, Jesus, because you're born again. But when you pray that prayer, that salvation conversion, that transformation that happens comes with a cross to bear. And what it means is I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation. It doesn't mean that it's arduous and difficult. No, I got to bear this cross. I'm a Christian. No, it means that I'm going to carry the cross with me wherever I go. I'm a Christian. I identify with Jesus Christ. My decisions I make are based on what my belief in the cross of Jesus Christ and him crucified and resurrected. That's what it's about. In a little bit, if you're going to be water baptized, will you please go ahead and be slip, uh, slip out and uh, get changed and get ready for that? Because those that are being water baptized today, they're being baptized because they're born again. There was a transformation that took place in their life. Going in this water and coming out doesn't save you. There's been a lot of people, they have got dunked, but they weren't baptized because they weren't born again. Because they thought that was salvation. This doesn't save you. You do this because you're telling the world, I'm born again. I am dying with Christ and now I'm being resurrected. I'm alive with Christ today. That's what salvation is. And there are some of you here in this room, you have never been baptized and you profess to be a Christian. My question is, are you a Christian if you've not been baptized? This is something that Jesus not only commanded us to do as a born again believer, but he was leading by example that water baptism is the next step of salvation. I'm born again. And there are some of you today You've never prayed that prayer because you've not been ready to surrender. You're not praying a prayer to me. You're not answering anyone in this room. You're praying to Jesus Christ so that your name will be written in the Lamb's book of life. There's a lot of things in this world that it can offer you, but it's only temporary. Fleeting. The fun, the parties, the excitement, the sex, the drugs, the freedom, not being bound to anything. Sure, it's fun for a season out there, but it leads to a life of regret. The Bible says hard is the way of the transgressor. Hard. It might be fun, but it's hard, but easy, light, 
When you give your life to Jesus, it's light, it's easy because he helps you. So if you are not born again, I'm gonna invite you in just a moment to lift your hand and pray a prayer with me. But I'm, I'm gonna give you the full picture right now. I'm gonna count to three, and if that's you and you wanna be born again, you raise your hand. When I count to three, I'm gonna clap my hand on three, and you just raise your hand up. And those that raise their hand, what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna have everybody stand, and those that raise their hand, I'm gonna invite you to come and stand right up here. There's a difference between I want to get saved and I'm going to get saved. Jesus said this, if you reject me before others, I will reject you before my Father in heaven. If you accept me or acknowledge me before others, I will acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. Too many people have done this and have walked out because I I prayed this special prayer. They walked out, but they've never acknowledged their salvation. That's because faith without works is dead. So today, the Spirit of God is already knocking on your heart's door. Just close your eyes, bow your heads. This is between you and God, this moment. This moment. If you want to receive Jesus Christ, if you're ready to surrender your life to Him, if you're ready to be born again. When I count to three, I'm going to clap my hand. You shoot your hand up. Don't look around. Don't wait for somebody else to raise their hand. Don't wait to see if your spouse will raise their hand. Well, if they raise their hand, I'll raise my hand. If, if they don't want to, then I'm going to go to hell with them. Stop it. It is your decision and your decision alone. And just shoot it up there. Here we go. Here we go. Most exciting point of your life. Here it is. One, two, three. Raise it up if that's you and you want to be born again. Is there a hand up there? I see one. Anyone at all? All right. All right, we're going to pray. Father, we thank you that we can come into this atmosphere. And Lord, that when we walk out of here, we know that we're not destined to lose. But God, we're going to get up off that mat and we're going to win. We're going to fight the fight of faith. We are not going to give in. We are not going to faint. But God, we are going to be strengthened by your spirit. And we are going to fight the fight of victory, the fight of faith. And we will win in our marriages. We will win in our families in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen.